Hello and welcome to another installment of the Otolivia videos. Today we'll be talking about jugulotympanic paragangliomas, but first we should start more broadly with just paragangliomas in general. So paragangliomas are an oma, a tumor of the paraganglia, so a neoplasm of the paraganglia. This is actually of the neuroendocrine chief cells. The most common paraganglioma that people know about are pheochromocytomas, which are actually a subcategory of paragangliomas. They are when a paraganglioma occurs in the adrenal medulla, and the neuroendocrine chief cells in this region are called chromaffin cells, hence the name pheochromocytoma. When paraganglioma's form in the extra adrenal paraganglion system, which is called the diffuse neuroendocrine system, they're just called paragangliomas. These can occur in both the sympathetic and parasympathetic diffuse neuroendocrine systems. So in the sy sympathetic um, system, you can get pheochromocytomas, which secrete epinephrine. But in the parasympathetic paraganglia, they tend to be non-secreting, or if they do secrete, it tends to be maybe norepinephrine or a dopamine derivative because the parasympathetic paraganglia lack phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase, an, an enzyme I'm sure everyone remembers from medical school, which converts norepi to epi. So head and neck paragangliomas pretty much always form in the parasympathetic paraganglia. These are most commonly carotid body tumors 60% of the time. The next most common are jugulotympanic paragangliomas, also called glomus tumors, which are the main topic of this lecture, which occur 30% of the time when there's a head and neck paraganglioma. But I will say glomus tumor is a misnomer, so we'll get to that in a second. And finally, vagal paragangliomas are the third most common, occurring about 10 in 10% 10 of head and neck paragangliomas. So I think the word glomus tumor is just such a, a ubiquitous way to describe jugulotympanic paragangliomas that it's worth explaining why it's a misnomer here. So glomus actually means in arteriovenous anastomosis. And when Dr. Guild was examining the temporal bone back in the 50s, he found many of these what he termed glomus bodies, little vascular areas, which were in sites that made sense for where quote-unquote glomus tumors were formed, which is why he called them that. Now we know that while they are very vascular, they're actually paraganglia, which is what he's finding. They're not just little AV anastomoses. And so since we know that they're paraganglia, we should call them what they are, which is a paraganglioma. The pathophysiology of paragangliomas is very interesting, and the research is very much ongoing, um, so I will just try and be somewhat broad here. But there is some sort of insult that leads to aberrant vasculogenesis within a paraganglion, and that vasculogenesis facilitates neurogenesis. The insult used to be uh, thought to be from a notch pathway dysregulation, but this has lately been in question whether it's just correlation versus causation, and so uh, I will just sort of breeze past that and say that it's not fully known yet. Um, but this neurogenesis leads to nests of neuroendocrine chief cells and sustenacular cells among a bed of capillaries. And with all of these buzzwords, I know that you already know that I'm talking about Zellbollen. And these tumors are classically benign. They are thought to be on a spectrum of quote-unquote metastatic potential. Metastatic potential is really difficult to distinguish from multiple primaries, which is also a common issue in patients with a genetic predisposition. Um, and the way you distinguish it is just if the tumors are in sites without paraganglia, for example, lymph nodes, so that would suggest metastasis. There are multiple genetic diseases that lead to a predisposition for developing paragangliomas. First is the MEN2 syndromes with the RET proto-oncogene. These lead to pheochromocytomas, medullary thyroid carcinoma, as well as parathyroid hyperplasia in MEN2A, and mucosal neuromas and marfanoid habitus in MEN2B. Neurofibromatosis type 1 with the NF1 gene leads to paragangliomas as well as, of course, neurofibromas, cafe au lait spots, optic gliomas, um, Lish nodules, seizures, developmental delays, etc. Von Hippel-Lindau disease with the VHL gene uh, leads to pheochromocytomas and endolymphatic sac tumors as well as hemangioblastomas. And finally, hereditary paragangliomas syndromes are the SDH genes, the succinate dehydrogenase genes. So in order to fully understand the SDH genes for these syndromes, we need to go way back and discuss the electron transport chain. So as you may remember, the electron transport chain lives between the intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix within the mitochondrial membrane. Electrons travel through this chain and with their energy pump protons into the intermembrane space. In the process of the electrons moving through, the succinate is converted to fumarate at complex 2 which is part of the Krebs cycle. Everyone says they hate the Krebs cycle because they never use it, but ha, huh, it's important. 
and eventually making a water molecule pumping more protons out and ADP is created when all the protons fall back down their concentration gradient into the mitochondrial matrix. So complex two, importantly, is succinate dehydrogenase, which is how the electron transport chain connects to the Krebs cycle. And it is unclear how succinate dehydrogenase is related to notch dysregulation. Again, that connection is kind of unclear and sort of in flux. But what is very clear is that if succinate dehydrogenase or complex two is mutated, succinate accumulates because the Krebs cycle can't move forward, leading to a state of pseudohypoxia because the electron transport chain can't move forward. And you get hypoxia-inducible factor stabilization, which leads to vasculogenesis, and that facilitates tumorigenesis, uh, and you get a paraganglioma. This is also where von Hippel-Lindau acts in the hypoxia-inducible factor stabilization. There are five subunits to succinate dehydrogenase, A, B, C, D, and AF2. AF2 flavonates the A component, so it's also required for function. And the two most important mutations that I think are going to be relevant in head and neck paragangliomas and jugulotympanic paragangliomas specifically are mutations in SDHB. This is the most common mutation and unfortunately has the highest metastatic potential. So we talked about how there isn't a single tumor that is benign or malignant. There's just metastatic potential. And greater than 20% of these tumors will become metastatic. Second is the SDHD mutation. This is the most commonly identified mutation because it has the highest penetrance, so it's most likely to result in a paraganglioma. And these patients are the ones who are most likely to have head and neck paragangliomas, so the ones that we as otolaryngologists care the most about. So finally, we're ready to talk about jugulotympanic paragangliomas specifically, the coolest ones that the otologists care about. Um, they form on the paraganglia in the temporal bone. The first place they may form is Jacobson's nerve, which is also known as the tympanic plexus or the tympanic branch of nine. These tumors are often isolated to the middle ear, and they originate on the promontory. So these are that tympanic paraganglioma that you'll see just isolated to the middle ear. A second location of paraganglia are along Arnold's nerve, which is also known as the auricular branch of 10 of vagus. Um, it originates in the mastoid and can be found in multiple locations. One is if it forms in the mastoid, it could push up into the middle ear and be seen there. But it also sort of lays over the jugular bulb and may be found in the jugular bulb as well as the mastoid. So a little bit more variable. And the third is the one everyone thinks about, which is the jugular bulb. And the paraganglia here are actually in the adventitia of the jugular bulb. And these would lead to a jugular paraganglioma or jugulotympanic if it extends up into the middle ear. And I'll just make a note here that paragangliomas in general are not encapsulated, and so they infiltrate rather than push. And so you'll see that pattern as we talk about the clinical presentation and the imaging findings, um, that they are really infiltrative. And this also unfortunately holds true for the surrounding nerves, that even before a patient has an obvious nerve deficit, it is possible that that nerve is being infiltrated just because there's really no pushing capsule on paragangliomas. There are multiple classification systems for paragangliomas. My mentors and I really like the FISH classification. It classifies paragangliomas by degree of involved structures. And is satisfyingly, a higher FISH class is associated with a decreased likelihood of gross total resection and poorer cranial nerve outcomes. So FISH class A are the tympanic paragangliomas. These are often Jacobson's nerve origin. FISH class B are considered hypotympanic or involve the hypotympanum. Class C are infralabyrinthine and apical compartments that are starting to become destroyed. So there's they're broken down into several subcategories. C1 has no carotid destruction whatsoever. C2 demonstrates some destruction of the jugular bulb and the foramen. C3 has invasion of the vertical carotid canal between the foramen and the bend. And C4 has invasion of the horizontal carotid canal. Fish class D involves the foramen lacerum, the cavernous sinus, and has intracranial components. And these are also broken up into some subcategories. DE1, the E stands for extradural, means that there is less than 2 centimeters of dural displacement. DE2 is greater than 2 centimeters of dural displacement. And then the DI subcategories are intradural extension, less than 2 centimeters and greater than 2 centimeters.
and thinking about the clinical presentation of jugulotympanic paragangliomas, you know, the symptoms really depend on which structures are involved. The most common symptom is pulsatile tinnitus. Um, second most common would be a conductive hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss can be caused by dampening the tympanic membrane because the mass is up against it, or there can be an associated effusion from a eustachian tube obstruction by the mass. Sensory neural hearing loss can occur if the labyrinth is invaded, if the cochlear aqueduct flow is affected, if cranial nerve 8 itself is affected, and any of these components may or may not also have comorbid vestibular symptoms. Um, dysphagia and dysphonia, cranial nerves 9 and 10, um, can also be affected quite commonly because they come right through the jugular foramen. About 25% of advanced jugulotympanic paragangliomas, which are cl fish class C and D paragangliomas, um, experience dysphagia and or dysphonia. The dysphagia onset tends to be very indolent. Um, patients may not complain of this because they're compensating prior to their diagnosis. And again, because paragangliomas are unencapsulated, sometimes nerves are actually infiltrated before they even have the symptoms of, of nerve issues, which makes surgical excision as treatment so challenging. Facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, can be affected at the level of the middle ear, the mastoid, the IAC, cerebellopontine angle, or the stylomastoid foramen, depending on where the paraganglioma is living. Facial palsy happens in about 15% of patients with advanced or fish class C and D jugulotympanic paragangliomas. On physical exam, if you see a cherry red pulsatile middle ear mass, it's a paraganglioma until proven otherwise. Do not biopsy that or it will absolutely ruin your day. Always perform bilateral otoscopy and look for contralateral disease because, again, as we discussed, patients with SDHD mutations are the ones who are most likely to have multiple primaries and the most likely to have head and neck paragangliomas. And so you don't want to miss bilateral jugulotympanic paragangliomas. Everyone deserves a full cranial nerve assessment, including flexible laryngoscopy, because, again, the vagus nerve travels right through the jugular foramen. 9, 10, 11, jugular foramen. And on imaging, MRI is more sensitive than CT in identifying all the sort of infiltrative fronds of a paraganglioma, but both can lead to a diagnosis of paraganglioma. So on CT, you'd see a moth-eaten bone because of uh, infiltration. You may see infiltration of the carotid ridge. And definitely anticipate a lower cranial nerve palsy if you see erosion at the medial wall of the jugular foramen. On MRI, they have a classic salt and pepper appearance because there's flow voids in such a vascular tumor when you're looking at T1 with contrast enhancement. Um, again, MRI is really best for determining the intracranial extent and the status of any of your cranial nerves. For the workup of these tumors, my mentor and I recently did a deep dive into paraganglioma literature for a book chapter that we wrote and developed this algorithm for working up any jugulotympanic paraganglioma that's been diagnosed. So this is our recommendation. Start with genetic testing and plasma-free metanephrines. Um, no longer do we need to do any of the urine 24-hour metanephrine testing. Plasma-free metanephrines are preferred. This can result in three buckets of outcomes. No mutations and normal metanephrines, no mutations and increased plasma metanephrines, and a positive mutation and then any metanephrines result. If there are no mutations and normal metanephrines, you can assume that this is an isolated jugulotympanic paraganglioma and manage it accordingly. For either of the other two outcomes, we recommend a whole body MRI. This is because less than 1% of jugulotympanic paragangliomas are secreting. And so if there's elevated metanephrines in the plasma, it's probably coming from something else, and you need to find the other primary in the whole body MRI. Similarly, if they have a positive mutation, the likelihood of them having multiple primary paragangliomas increases dramatically, and so that also warrants a whole body MRI. If there are no other tumors, you can manage the isolated jugulotympanic paragangglioma again. If there are other tumors, then, of course, multidisciplinary management. Treatment of jugulotympanic paragangliomas falls into three categories, surgery, radiation, and observation. For surgery, you can do gross total resection or subtotal resection. For radiation, you can do conventional fractionation with radiation therapy or stereotactic radial surgery, either hypofractionated for larger tumors in three to five sessions or a single session for smaller tumors. And there's always the option of observation, depending on the characteristics of the patient. Dr. Ivan and colleagues in 2011 did a meta-analysis of the literature on gross total resection versus radiotherapy for management of these tumors, and I thought that the results of their study really well represented the results of the literature as a whole. The local control achieved with attempted gross total resection was 78 to 88 percent, so pretty good. However, with radiotherapy, 
they still had local control of over 90%, usually characterized by a lack of growth or progression of the tumor. After treatment, 38% of patients who underwent gross total resection and less than 10% of those who underwent radiotherapy developed a cranial nerve 9 deficit. 26% of gross total resection and, again, less than 10% of those with radiotherapy developed a vagal nerve deficit. And 40% of those who underwent gross total resection and 12% of those who underwent radiotherapy developed a cranial nerve 11 deficit. So really striking differences. But of course, there are patients who warrant surgery over radiotherapy, and how do we parse that out? Some considerations include the age and frailty of the patient, the rate of tumor growth, the degree of symptoms and cranial nerves involved, the risk of contralateral tumors or a pre-existing contralateral lower cranial nerve palsy, because as you would suspect, a bilateral lower cranial nerve palsy can be devastating for a patient, especially an elderly patient. They could wind up trached or pegged. The location of jugular tympanic paragangliomas surrounded by lower cranial nerves and vasculature makes treatment both very interesting and very challenging. And so really the goal here is just maximum functional preservation for these patients. Our treatment algorithm uses the FISH classifications to guide recommended therapy. So for limited jugular tympanic paragangliomas, which fall into the FISH class A and B categories, gross total resection is usually achievable, and there's a local control rate of over 90% with a very low rate of cranial nerve palsies. For those with advanced FISH C and D tumors, the default pathway is to go down radiation therapy. But there are a couple of questions that we have to ask ourselves first. Is this considered a metastatic tumor, or do they have an SDHB mutation? That's the mutation that would increase the risk of metastatic potential. If yes, consider pursuing surgery. With surgery, you can either do gross total resection or a planned subtotal resection with either adjuvant or salvage RT in the future. If they don't have a metastatic tumor or SDHB mutations, you ask yourself, are they secreting tumors, and is the patient symptomatic from the secreting tumor? Again, jugular tympanic paragangliomas are less likely to secrete epinephrine and more likely to secrete norepinephrine or a dopamine derivative, and so maybe less symptomatic or completely asymptomatic compared to something like a pheochromocytoma. If yes, pursue surgery. If no, ask yourself whether or not there's intracranial mass effect. Of course, in that scenario, they would also require surgery for decompression. If not, ask if there's been failed local control after prior surgery or prior RT. Have you already sort of burned the bridge of radiation therapy in this area, and now would you be putting the patient at too great a risk of side effects? If no, consider whether or not they had a pretreatment facial nerve palsy. If so, you can repair the facial nerve at the time of surgery with an interposition graft, but consider that the best you can really get with an interposition graft is House Brackman 3, and so you'd want them to be at least House Brackman 3 prior to surgery. If not, continue down the default pathway to radiation therapy or stereotactic radiosurgery. And then finally, there's always that last bucket of observation, which really depends on a lot of patient characteristics. And we would argue to consider it just a hint more strongly in a patient with SDHD mutations, because these patients are really likely to have multiple primaries and contralateral disease. And the last thing that you want to do is pursue surgery or aggressive radiation therapy resulting in lower cranial nerve palsies if they're going to develop a contralateral tumor that is, say, more aggressive and requires treatment again in the future. So to summarize, paragangliomas are vascular neoplasms of neuroendocrine chief cells. They have a strong genetic component, and genetic testing should be offered to all patients. Look for secretion and suspect other primaries if they're positive in a head and neck paraganglioma patient. The FISH classification is useful for stratifying tumors and can help guide management. Lower cranial nerve palsies, pulsatile tinnitus, and hearing loss are common presenting symptoms, and you can diagnose this tumor on imaging and physical exam without a biopsy. Radiation is the workhorse of treatment given the risk of iatrogenic lower cranial nerve palsies, except in specific circumstances. I know my handwriting is abysmal, and so there's a typed summary of this entire lecture in the Google Drive, which is linked in the video description. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you found it helpful, and feel free to like or subscribe if you don't want to miss the next one.